Okay. Our mission. Helping Parents Heal is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting bereaved parents to become shiny light parents by providing support and resources to aid in the healing process. We go a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and evidence for the afterlife in a non-dogmatic way. Affiliate groups welcome everyone regardless of religious or non-religious background and allow for open dialogue. Attendance today at the Helping Parents Heal meeting is voluntary and we are here for the benefit of learning from and sharing from other parents whose child has passed away. It is understood that our discussions are intended to be confidential and not designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. Helping Parents Heal offers a wide variety of speakers to allow parents to be informed about many possible ways to heal, to connect with their children, and to learn about the afterlife. The views expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect those of Helping Parents Heal, and we ask that you take from their presentations whatever may benefit you personally. Thank you, Lynn. That was wonderful. And so I'd like to just do a short introduction uh, for Dr. Lucy Hone. And I am so grateful that she's here all the way from New Zealand. Um, one, of, one of the first books that I read on this healing journey was about her daughter, Abby. So I am very, very grateful that she's here to speak to us again this time. Um, so let's, let's just tell you a little bit about her. While there are many resilience researchers in the world, the death of her 12-year-old daughter in a tragic road accident makes Dr. Lucy Hone's story quite unique. She writes books, academic articles, and blogs to spread her insights far and wide. Co-director of the New Zealand Institute of Wellbeing and Resilience, an adjunct fellow at the University of Canterbury in Christchurch, New Zealand, Hone's research is published internationally and her PhD was acknowledged for its outstanding contribution to well-being science at the World Congress of Positive Psychology in 2019. Her best-selling book, Resilient Grieving, Associated Online Training Courses, Coping with Loss, A Practical Guide for Helping Professionals, and Insight Timer, plus her hugely popular TED Talk, Three Secrets of Resilient People, have brought her fresh approach to grief to the global audience. Hone's work has been featured in several documentaries by the BBC, Swedish Television, The Bolt Report Australia, and TVNZ. And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lucy Hone. And I'm just so grateful that you're here Maybe if you could tell us, since we are all Shining Light parents, a little bit about what has, uh, what has brought you to this type of research and your own personal experience with grief. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for that incredible introduction and Lynn, um, both of you. And firstly, I just want to thank everybody who's here in the room today to say um, well done for showing up, making the effort to be here today because that's really hard, isn't it? Sometimes just to um, drag yourself to do these things and you know it will, you hope it will be good and do you good, but it's still really hard sometimes to uh, make that happen. So huge respect to anybody who's in the room and um, and I firstly also want to acknowledge all of our beautiful um, deceased, you know, all those that we have lost, all those precious souls that mean so much to us and will never be forgotten. So um, to all of you, you know, I, I wish I hadn't had to do this work. I wish you weren't here and yet together it is so good to have um, time and connection to bear our grief. Um, so you asked me, Elizabeth, about my work and um, how it came to be. And if anybody who has watched my TED talk will know this, but essentially I was already a 
resilience researcher um, when Abby died. And so in many ways, I was, I would count myself as pretty fortunate because I had had the benefit of looking, um, knowing, poring over all of, you know, the literature of resilience. So this is my field. Um, I've been trained in the ways of thinking and acting and the cultures that enable us to really, you know, have this capacity for resilience. And so when our dear girl, Abby, who was 12 years old when she was killed in a car crash back in 2014, when she died, I think I was, I do consider myself fortunate in that I had all this knowledge. Um, so resilience research is about um, the ways of thinking and acting and environments that enable humans to cope with terrible adversity. Um, and I want to stress from the beginning that resilience isn't about taking away your pain because nothing can do that. Um, and that longing and keening um, for those that we have lost is it doesn't take away those negative emotions, but what I can say is that applying the tools of resilience to the bereavement context have, I think in technical terms, we would say they have supported healthy adaptation to loss. So that's the jargon. Um, but in essence, what that means is it, it helped me, um, knowing this stuff helped me muddle through and it gave me I guess you know ways of thinking um, and ways of acting that I knew had been effective from the studies I'd seen for all sorts of people in experiencing all sorts of traumas and stresses and disasters and so what I did was take that body of knowledge of resilience psychology and experiment to see how useful it was for me when um, faced with my own grief. And um, to you know, cut a long story short, what my experience and all the training that I um, have done with other people since has shown is that for many people, for most people, it is possible to grieve and live at the same time. You know, it's not what we choose. It's messy. Um, it's, um, it's tough, but actually it is possible to relearn how to live in the world and learn to live without your loved one that you have lost. That's, that's beautifully said. And I, I also know that you have two beautiful boys who were in their teens when Abby crossed over and who are now in their 20s. Mm -hmm. And um, I would love to hear from you if it is possible to teach teens and kids who are in their 20s or basically siblings about resilient grieving and if it's something that has worked for your boys. Thank you. Um, and it's, it's interesting, um, Elizabeth, Lynn, everybody who's here today. The first thing I should say to you is that for many years, I refused to talk to anybody about anybody in public, like on an interview or um, a webinar such as this about my boys, because they were 14 and 15 um, when Abby died. And as anybody who's been the um, fortunate parents of teenage boys will know, they're not really most in touch with their emotions at that point. And they don't, well, they might be in touch with their emotions, but they definitely don't want to talk to their mum about them. So um, I learned pretty quick to leave them. I'm, I'm going to say leave them alone with their grief and not pester and um, interfere and you know, keep asking them about it. I kept, uh, they were, we were all living at home, you know, they're at 14 and 15. That was one blessing that I was lucky enough to have them under our roof still. So I could keep a close eye on them and they seem to be doing 
pretty well. You know, I went back to school three weeks after Abby died. And I knew because I've lived through um, a series of terrible earthquakes here in our hometown of Christchurch, I knew that when you've had a traumatic experience, the most helpful thing you can do is try and put some kind of routine around your everyday life to tell your poor traumatized brain that it's the time for fight or flight is over and it is safe now to go back to normal. So in doing these kind of very everyday things like getting up, having breakfast, you know, getting on the bus, going to school, being with their friends, coming home on the bus, having dinner, watching TV, doing a little bit of prep homework and going to bed, that I knew was probably the best thing for them. So they did that and they seemed to be okay. And then I looked into the bereavement research even more because I was really curious. I was worried that they would, by not demonstrating any signs of outward grief, that maybe they would be succumb to delayed grief. You know, as a mother, I really worried it would come back to bite them. I don't know if any of your listeners today have had that phrase in their head, but that was what was really worrying me, you know, is if, if they don't address it now, is it gonna come back and bite them? And actually, so I was delighted to discover and read the um, research that suggests that many people don't, just don't really have those outward um, manifestations or, you know, signs of grief. That doesn't mean that they're, you know, um, clinically, uh, it doesn't mean that they have got complicated grief, we call it. Um, it doesn't mean that they're going to get delayed grief. It doesn't mean that they are not processing it all internally. And actually, best of all, for me, really, there's very little evidence that those people um, do get delayed grief, you know, that they get it as a sort of later onset. So that gave me more confidence to stop pestering them about counselling and um, just believe that they were okay. And, and we would talk about Abby, you know, um, where I'm at home today and she's still um, here in so many ways. We have, you know, all lots of her stuff still around and there's pictures of course of her. And so we would be, she would be in conversation, but they wouldn't talk about their feelings. And I'm delighted to say, so we're seven years on now that they are now starting to talk about her much more and their feelings. Um, and they will come to me and, and you know, they'll have, I get those occasional sort of drunken phone calls from them where they'll be crying or something. They'll kill me for saying this. But, you know, so I, um, I, I've, I know and I'm comforted by the fact that she will be part of their lives forever. And they know that. Um, and Paddy, the middle boy, um, has a beautiful tattoo of Abby here on his neck. He's got her, her name and her dates. And he had that done, I think that was two summers ago. And I thought that was really interesting that that was obvious that he was ready to talk to people about his sister. You know, you don't go and get a tattoo without her name, without being ready to, to go outwardly and discuss it. So um, it's, it's just a journey and I'm always curious to hear from other parents who, you know, bereaved parents about their experiences with them um, from oh. other siblings. What about you, Elizabeth? So interesting because for me, my two daughters were in their teens as well. They're now in their 20s, mm -hmm. but both of them decided to study in London instead of studying here in the States. One was at the London School of Economics and one was, uh, well, one was at Sciences Po in France first and then at the London School of Economics. And then one was at, um, at London, uh, uh, let's see, University College London, both of their master's degrees. Now, one of my daughters is back in the States, but one of my daughters explained to me that she wanted to be able to get to a place where no one knew her and no one knew Morgan so that she could uh, forge her own life um, without being the sister whose brother passed. And I think that that, when you were talking about Patty, 
being able to show that t tattoo. Both of them got tattoos for Morgan. They got his name in Tibetan on their ribs um, way too early. And um, one was at 15, the other one as 17. And we agreed to let them do that because my 17 year old was going off to school. But um, I, I think that for these kids, they like to be able to, um, in the very beginning, disassociate so that they don't have to be that that sibling who had a, a, a sister or brother pass. I think that as they go forward, it gets easier and um, they're able to talk about it without being sad. And so it makes it an easier thing. But I was going to say that your sons are so lucky. They're so fortunate to be able to have a mom who understands all of this and who's able to help them through this and who's able to watch out and make sure that their silence about their sister is not something that's going to come back and kick them later on. I, uh, I truly didn't think that it was going to for the girls because they both felt so certain that Morgan was actually with them every step of the way and that he was helping them he actually saved their lives a couple times in Paris and in other places. And so I, I feel uh, that they knew that they're very, very intuitive. I think that they have a relationship with Morgan that's very, um, that's even deeper in many ways than the relationship that I have with him. So, um, but anyway, I, I had some other questions that I'd love to ask you. Some people on the on the Zoom meeting have not been able to see your TED talk, and I would really like for you to talk about the three strategies because they're so easy to help us cope with sorrow and tragedy that you discussed in that TED talk. Would you be willing to do so? Yes, um, of course. And um, I, I need to say first, it has absolutely staggered me the reaction to my TED talk. I, I had no idea, you know, I did it at our local, I did it because I agreed to do it because um, after the earthquakes, we lost 80% of our city buildings here in 2011. And in 2019, eight years later, we finally had our beautiful, big kind of performance hall reopened it took eight years. Um, and so they asked me that year whether I'd be part of that. And, and given my topic is resilience, it felt so fitting to be there. So, so I said yes. And um, I, I really hate public speaking. I now do so much of it that actually in reality, I, I, I don't hate it as much as I used to. But I can see that I'm shaking the whole way through that TED Talk. I just hated the whole day, really. I loved everybody else's, but hated mine. Um, and because, of course, of the COVID pandemic, it just went viral last year because clearly everybody is Googling how to be resilient. And, um, and I think it is fair to say that resilience is a really little understood um, concept. People know they need it. They know they want it. And all of the work that we do with organisations all over the world at the moment, it is driven by the fact that they come to us to say, can you help explain to us how we can build resilience in our teams? And so then I think the TED Talk resonated because while there are lots of different ways to build resilience, and of course you have to find what works for you, that is the most important thing. And you have to live in a culture and a situation and environment that enables you to be resilient. You know, if you're sleeping rough and you're sleeping in your car and you've got no money and no job uh, it's a lot harder to be resilient but if you're not doing those things and the environment is conducive there are ways of thinking that can really help and so I picked the three that had really helped me um, and they are they clearly just resonate with people so the first is to understand that um I think I say in the talk that shit happens <laughs> you know that suffering and struggle as much as we loathe it is part of life um, and that living through tough times 
is um, something we are all likely to experience. But on top of that, it is actually something that as humans, we are hardwired to do. You know, we are incredibly resilient. We can all build this resilience in ourselves. So the first step is to understand that when terrible things happen to you, that you are not alone that adversity doesn't discriminate. Um, and as everybody on, you know, watching this video knows and doesn't need to be told, you know, terrible things happen. And sadly, they can happen to me, they can happen to you, and they have done. So knowing this is pretty critical because it stops you, well, I shouldn't say it stops you, it, it, diminishes the likelihood of you feeling singled out, you know, discriminated against. So I think knowing, and I've been explicitly taught this as part of my resilience training, that knowing that tough times happen to us all and that adversity doesn't discriminate stopped me from doing that kind of why me thing after Abby died, you know, made me think as much as I don't like this and as much as this is hell to live through, I know that that is part of the human experience. So that was the first one that suffering is part of life and that we all have moments of struggle. And of course, while that's important for bereavement, it's important in everyday life to understand that. And if you didn't get that before COVID, I'm picking that everybody has got that now, truly. So that's the first one. And then the second one is that when tough times um, arrive, to understand that the where you focus your attention is really critical for the way you experience whatever is happening to you. So actually as humans, we think that our attention is like some kind of big stadium floodlights, that we see everything equally, but actually the way we are wired means that we draw our focus much more like a laser beam onto the negative. Um, and sometimes that's useful and helpful for us as humans, but actually in a situation where you have lost someone, you are going to be dwelling in the negative anyway. And so, what my training had taught me was to be really selective and careful over where I focused my attention so that I also made sure that I was noticing the good stuff that was still in my life. So I'm not running around saying, hey, let's be positive and bounce back because actually I hate that kind of view of resilience that I certainly didn't feel bouncy for many, many years. So, but I did, know that I was really fortunate to still have our beautiful boys. I was really fortunate to have um, a strong supportive family and friends who, you know, helped cook for us and just came with us on that journey. Um, so, you know, relationships matter. They really do matter for resilience. So that was the second thing to really understand that resilient people are really good at focusing their attention on what they've got, what's still good in their world, and the things that they can change, not the stuff that they can't. You know, try not to get fixated on the things that you have no control over. And, you know, if you're listening to this and think, well, that's not easy, then you're right, that is not easy, but, the, this is where the third strategy comes in that I would um, ask myself if I was focusing my attention on something and I'd start thinking I'm not sure that this is a good idea I would ask myself you know is what you are doing right now Lucy the way you're thinking or the way you're acting helping or harming you in your quest to get through this terrible time you know to to keep your family together, to survive Abby's loss, to learn to live without her. So it would stop me, for instance, from um, trawling through Instagram pictures, you know, late at night looking at her or nowadays what her friends are doing. Um, and it it's kind of puts you in the driver's seat asking yourself, you know, is what I'm doing. So whether it is the fifth glass of wine, whether it is 
trawling through the you know media notifications that keep pinging up on your phone whether it is i don't know reading the coroner's report i never read abby's coroner's report because it made me the word coroner makes me feel sick it still does to be fair so so it it's the real beauty of asking yourself this question is it puts you in the driver's seat and it also implies that you know what's best for you That's beautiful. And I, I think that that's true. I actually didn't read the coroner's report for Morgan either. Didn't help anything and there's no reason to do it, but there's no shame in doing so. If you decide that that's something that actually is helpful to, to you, I think it's important to do it. But um, I know that a lot of people feel that not doing that is maybe not loving our children enough. I'm sure that they could care less if we read that kind of stuff anyway. But I was wondering about relationships, going back to number two, did you find that keeping those relationships that used to be so important to you in your life was more difficult after Abby transitioned or was it easy to keep these people in your life that are so important to you? Um, I think it is really important to acknowledge that for lots of us maintaining um, some relationships is really challenging after you have become bereaved. Um, I, looking back on it now, um, I, I think actually living where we live made a difference because we live in this city, Christchurch, that we had, we were just coming out of our earthquake years. You know, we had this big earthquake in 2011, where 195 people died in our downtown area when this earthquake happened in a busy lunchtime Tuesday. So I, I think that probably did make a difference to us that we'd already been through so much as a community. Um, we had five or six harrowing earthquakes after that as aftershock. We had 10,000 aftershocks afterwards. So I think we truly had learned to do things differently as a community to lean on people and it had taught us to reach out and ask for help and so maybe for me I'm, I was a bit more practiced at it but I also think um, if, I, if I think back to those early weeks and months I was in no fit state to do anything you know I, I, I doubt I could have I don't know really you know it's just such a terrible bleak time isn't it um, and for anyone who's listening, who's in that first year or even two years, I really want to say to you, it does get better. I don't know how we learn to live without those that we, you know, have lost. But I do know that I still love her as much as ever. And I think it's really important to think about your relationship with you know, your, your child as well. And, and for me, that was a real breakthrough to understand that I could continue to love Abby, even in separation. You know, I, I didn't, I, I would like her to be here, but given she's not here, that doesn't mean I have to turn off the love. And that was really huge for me. That's a beautiful way of saying that. I love that. And I, I also love the fact that you have put together a series of courses that are available to be able to teach people resilient grieving and to teach people how to move forward after a very difficult um, grief. So not necessarily the passing of a child, but, um, but definitely this is one of the most difficult. So could you tell us about your work a little bit and what you're doing at the university there and the different uh, courses that you're coming out with that are actually available all over the world? Yes, yeah, so um, we had just a lot of demand from people who had read my book and, um, and now have, have seen the TED Talk, but people were asking us for to put those actionable steps into a course and actually people would often email me and say I'm making a course around your work so in the end we thought okay maybe we should be doing this um, and so at the moment we have an eight part 
course, which is for, we call it helping, you know, professionals, but it really can be any person who is supporting somebody going through any type of loss. Um, and this is an online program that can be accessed through our website, which is just www.nziwr.co.nz. I'll put it in the chat in a minute. Um, but the course is, um, it, it follows very much, it's aligned with my book and it has different sessions on um, relationships, on post-traumatic growth, on how to help people build a legacy um, of for the one you know that they've lost and so um, what, uh, some great work on positive emotions um, Judy Moskovitz's work who is um, in America and so we basically have spoken to lots of different researchers and we also have a podcast so I should try and put you the link in there because the course is paid for podcast is free um, and Denise, my co-founder at the Institute, interviewed some incredible people all over the world for this podcast. And we tried to make it really um, diverse as well, so to have a real diversity of voices, because so much of this work is just done by, you know, white middle-aged people who look very like me. And so, you know, that's not really good enough, is it? So um, I will st stick in the chat in a minute, the, um, the links to Denise's podcast. And she's from Dublin and she has the most beautiful lilting Irish accent as well. So she's easy to listen to. But we're now, um, so far we haven't had anything for the bereaved. And so I'm currently involved in filming. I'm going to make them, we're going to make them just single shots of, you know, you could just buy one short course on sort of 20 minute video because when you're grieving to buy an eight session course is probably way beyond your capacity. Um, and so I think it is just quite helpful for people to be able to, um, they're kind of like snack size, you know, just, all that you can cope with when you're at that stage of life because I remember that so well that your poor brain is um, pretty fried hey well I think that a TED talk is exactly the amount of time that a lot of people can devote to um, learning something and so that TED talk that you did was just perfect for so many people to be able to learn about resilient grieving and we have a question in the chat box and I don't know if this is something that you've learned through what you're doing through your research but Gianna is saying that she's having a very hard time with her appetite um, what would it be something that maybe through resilient uh, resilience training that she might be able to get it back. Anyone have any suggestions on how she can start getting interest in food again? Is that something that you've studied at all in, in what you're doing? It's not something I've studied, but um, I would also say, um, Gianna, I don't know how long you've been grieving for, but um, I think it would be pretty typical um, if it's not long, you know, so I think the important way to look at your grieving is that we all have, um, we all experience so many different symptoms and we all grieve differently. Um, and if you're stuck in one emotion and you can never get out of feeling angry or guilty or, you know, shame or you're not eating or you're not sleeping. So something is really interfering with your functioning on an ongoing basis, then that is the time to reach out to your health professional. But if it's temporary, then I think that is just very understandable. I wonder what, we've got such an amazing wealth of experience on this call. I wonder what other people have found with their appetite. I remember I couldn't eat much, little bit. Well, I think that I, I lost probably 20 pounds in the very beginning, but it, it, got, it came back. And I think that that is um, obviously, even though we don't think that we're going to get better, we always do. And I believe that our kids want us to get better. So they help us eat 
later mm -hmm. on. Um, and maybe that's an issue right now. I, I would love to just tell you though, that there are people saying things like, thank you for taking us through these key points. This is really helpful and a great way to focus on healing. We have somebody else and I think this, this question is very interesting and I know we don't have a lot of time, but maybe if you could just address this at the end, towards the end, um, is it possible to be overly resilient? I've been on this grief journey for about 20 years since my daughter passed. I often um, am reaching out to be there for newly uh, bereaved. I'm actively involved in multiple support groups, healing others heals. But there are times I question if I've missed the mark or if covering I'm covering up my own needs because of my resilient nature. What, what would you say to that, um, Lucy? Um, Carrie, it's such a good question. And I think, firstly, I want to applaud your self-awareness because self-awareness um, is the bedrock of resilience you know that our a our ability to be able to notice how we're feeling and whether that is working for us or whether we need help whether we need professional help whether we need you know friendship help family help is absolutely fundamental so um it is it is so firstly let's take you out of the equation because it's hard for me to know you personally but it is certainly um when you say is it possible to be overly resilient um, there are firstly di different people think of different things with resilience so I remember at one point my sister then who lives three hours up the coast from me had um, an earthquake through three years after our big earthquake actually no five years after our big earthquake and it was completely unexpected a completely different part of the country and you know we both live in London we both born in London and we moved here so it was pretty devastating and we couldn't get her out and I couldn't contact her and I lost it. My mother's already died, my daughter's died, and my sister um, was, you know, basically her home was about to be flooded by a river, the earthquake, she was on the epicenter of the quake. And everybody kind of turned around to me and went, seriously, you need to get a grip. And I said to them, no, <laughs> seriously, I don't. This is how I'm meant to be behaving right now, you know? It's okay to experience real fear and terror and all these these horrible, huge emotions. My sister right now is uncontactable and in huge danger, and I've already lost two members of my family. So when your response is appropriate, that is part of being resilient, even though I was crying and hyperventilating and really anxious, you know? So that I think people often get that bit of resilience wrong. They think it is about being stoic, unemotional, and just, you know, bouncing back and carrying on with life. So there's nothing wrong with experiencing all emotions. Resilient people really do live the entire emotional range. They don't get stuck in one emotion though. Um, so that's really important to understand. And then, Carrie, I am going to speak a little bit to um, your question because I, I also think this. I've um, my brother has died in lockdown in England, and I haven't been able to get back to him. And my father has recently um, he has dementia, and he's been put in a mental hospital also in England, and I can't get back to him. And I think I feel pretty numb. Um, and I think that's also understandable. So maybe you and I are, you know, a bit the same. And I like to think of it as um, I'm not completely numb. You know, I still experience emotions and I live a full life. But I, I think sometimes when you've been through so much that, that of course your reactions and responses do get a little bit numbed. Um, and so I watch myself, I, you know, I'm just going back to the self-awareness piece. I'm just watching it and thinking, if I feel like I'm becoming a complete heartless cow, then I will be off to see a counselor or a doctor or someone. But, um, you know, I, maybe you're, I, I don't know your, the details of your situation, Carrie, but maybe your response is, um, also, um, you know, what it is, 
and that's your way of dealing with it. So I think we go back to the helping or harming question, Carrie, and say, if the way you react and respond is harming you and your, for instance, your life is getting smaller and shrinking and you're pulling away from people or you're getting exhausted and run down and neglecting your own emotional health, then yes, it that is over resilience and time to pull it back. But if it's working for you and helping other people gives you huge meaning in your life and purpose, and that's become your life mission, then we know that it's very common for resilient people to have a strong sense of mission. And we also know that that mission very often comes, is born out of bereavement. So maybe you're just normal. That's a beautiful answer. And I think that it's important to know too, I had a lot of friends right after Morgan passed that kept telling me that I was going to experience a terrible crash at some time because I was always upbeat. And I, I was, of course, I missed Morgan like crazy, but I knew he was with me and I was doing as much as I could to help others. And I think that um, one thing that is important to know that is it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to crash. It, it could be that you're just wired that way. And it's, and it's a good thing because, um, again, helping others helps us even more. But I wanted to just ask how your sister is. Did she, did she get out of that flooding? And, um, she did. Yeah, she lost her home. And, um, to be truthful, she and I, did have a chuckle the other day of saying seriously our, our, you know it is kind of unfathomable to imagine that our father is now also um, in a hospital and we can't we can't get there we can't get to England uh, I mean I, you know I haven't I haven't actually even told any of my friends here because I just don't really know what I think myself really um, so um, yeah my sister and I are pretty close and we have been through a lot, but we also really choose to tune into the good stuff. And she has the most beautiful, incredible um, five children, but one, her fourth child is a 24 year old Down syndrome hero. Um, and last year, her second son managed to somehow get himself on the sailing boat at the America's Cup. He was a builder. He went to be part of the team as a builder and started going so well in the gym on the grinding machine that he got put on the boat. So they won the America's Cup. And so Rufus, our Down syndrome nephew, was on the front page of the paper and in TV holding the America's Cup. So we just, I think we both just think that life's pretty crazy, hey? And, and um, on a serious note for everybody here, I. When I think that I, how sad I am that I will never be able to go to, you know, Abby's wedding or um, be part of her life and have her um, grandchildren and things. And I, it's easy for me to imagine all the things that I won't be able to do with her and because of her not being here. But I also, what I think is really amazing is that you can never foresee the good stuff that is ahead. And our, um, our America's Cup summer journey was just like, we'll just seriously, we'll drink in that good stuff because that was a moment none of us ever saw coming and um, truly has filled up our cups for uh, quite some time. Abby was sailing with him on that on that ship the whole time. I'm sure, a hundred percent. I I just think that that's beautiful. But you're right. There's so much good stuff to come, and there's no way to gauge it um, immediately following the passing of a child. But we find out as we move forward, and it does get easier. This this journey gets easier, and that's the most important thing to understand. That it doesn't stay this hard forever and I love the way that you speak Lucy it's just beautiful and um, I know that we are running over time we were supposed to only do 40 minutes it's already been 47 minutes so maybe if you want to just um, uh, wrap up with just a few words to our parents that would be wonderful thank you so much um, everyone for coming today and you know if you're watching this video later then actually all I ever want to say to you is um, 
to just believe that you can get through this, that as humans, we are hardwired for resilience. We have this incredible capacity to adapt and change in even the worst circumstances, you know, and in ways that we never want to change, but truly you can relearn to live in the world with help and support and time and work out what helps you and what harms you in that process. Um, and I truly do believe you can learn to live and grieve at the same time. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. And um, at the end of all of these uh, meetings, we always ask people to unmute and say thank you and goodbye. And I, I will make sure to put all of the information about your courses as well as your TED Talk in the information that I'll be posting on YouTube as well. But thank you all for coming. And if you'd like to just unmute and say Hey, thank you and goodbye to Dr. Lucy Holmes for coming to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening and we'll see you tomorrow for um, tomorrow is going to be Pauline. And then we also have Andrea Corey for sound healing. So please join us and we'll see you then. Take care. Bye. Good everyone. night, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Lucy. Bye-bye. Thank you.